Hi, I'm Mark Reisbaum, a longtime JFN member based in San Francisco, and I'm delighted to introduce our workshop on diversity, equity, and inclusion in Jewish philanthropy in the West. Has anyone else here ever felt the need to sing or to pray really loudly at synagogue where you're thinking the people around you might be wondering how Jewish I really am? My grandparents, Max and Bobby Lemley, were pillars of the Los Angeles Jewish community. I had a strong and wonderful Jewish upbringing. Still around the age of 16 or 17, I started to feel like I didn't belong. As a young man struggling with my sexuality, I began to avoid the Jewish teen events that were very overtly about boys meeting girls. When I started college at Columbia in New York, I figured I'd try Hillel. I walked in with my gorgeous strawberry blonde hair and OP pants, and two people immediately came up to me and asked me if I was in the right place. I left and never came back. And I mean it, for most of the next two decades, I didn't participate in Jewish life, except for family holiday celebrations. In 1997, when I was 36, my interest in philanthropy brought me back. It was for a job opportunity at the Jewish Community Federation and Endowment Fund based in San Francisco. That federation had been the first in the country to convene a gay and lesbian task force. So perhaps my timing was beshert. Through my work, I rediscovered the joys and meaning of the Jewish community. A colleague told me about Shar Zahav, one of the first LGBT synagogues, and I tried it for Arab Rosh Hashanah. All these years later, I remember vividly how it felt to hear the songs and prayers I grew up with, being surrounded by same gender couples holding hands. It was incredible. I felt whole. Outside that safe space, I was still somewhat of an oddity. Back when the GA was drawing 10,000 people each year, I was one of maybe five or six openly LGBT professionals who attended. When I began the Wexner Heritage Program in 2008, I was the only LGBT person in my group of 20. In fact, I was the only one among the 60 members in the three cohorts that started that year. Today, as an independent philanthropy advisor working with individuals and family foundations, I bring an understanding of what it feels like to be an outsider still to my work. All my clients and nearly every Jewish funder I've ever met care deeply about the future of our Jewish community. But to be successful in building a strong Jewish future, we really need to understand the data. Who is our community's future? 23% of Jewish young adults now live here in the Western United States. In a recent national study by Atlantic 57 on unlocking the future of Jewish engagement, the data reported that one in seven Jewish young adults identifies as a race other than white or as more than one race. In almost identical number, self-identify as LGBT. 6% or about one in 16 are Russian speakers. While the dynamics of acceptance and inclusion for LGBT people may be different than for Jews of color, I believe there are lessons that translate. And I'll pose a few of these as questions. Who do I see in the room? Who is really showing up to our Jewish spaces? Do the leaders and staff of this organization reflect my identity or my family's identity? How about its board? When I research an organization or program online, do I see images that speak to me, people that look like me or who look like people I wanna be friends with? Will my child's teacher or camp counselors understand our family? How about the clergy at that synagogue? If I go to that retreat or conference, will there be speakers who I can relate to? Will they be open to the perspectives I bring? Will there be other people there I wanna spend time with? 
I'll move right into our program with a caveat. This is just the beginning of our important learning together on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we'll only be able to scratch the surface in 45 minutes. This morning, I have the great fortune to hear from my friend and colleague, Ilana Kaufman. We have the great fortune. Ilana is the founder and CEO of the National Jews of Color Initiative. She'll share more data and her high level thoughts on the value proposition for funders to invest in an anti-racist Jewish community that is truly welcoming of Jews of color. Following Ilana's framing, we'll hear briefly from two funders, one with a local focus and one with a national one, both of whom have begun to make significant investments in this work. Ilana Rodan Schultz, president and CEO of the Rodan Family Foundation, will share highlights of her family foundation's exciting early work on racial inclusion in the East Bay Jewish community. Jen John Marker, Senior Program Officer at the Jim Joseph Foundation, will share how that foundation reflected back to its primary documents and core mission to define its commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion work within the Jewish community. After Ilana, Ilana, and John, we'll have about 10 minutes to process and discuss what we've heard in breakout sessions. Take it away, Ilana Kaufman. Um, first of all, just good morning, and it's really just my my huge privilege to not only share um, the screen and the stage with all of the colleagues, but to just see everybody out there and thank you for showing up. And I just also want to thank you, Mark, for your opening um, comments. Um, I spent, I think, three or four years on the same floor as you at the San Francisco Federation and Endowment Fund and never had an opportunity to build a relationship with you in this way. And so I just want to thank you uh, for sharing that wonderful introduction. Um, can I get a thumbs up from somebody out there, please, if my screen looks right to all of you. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Sylvia. Um, my name is Alana Kaufman. I'm the Executive Director of the Jews of Color Field Building Initiative, and I'm going to take the next 12-ish minutes to talk with you a little bit about our work, the data, and why all of this work really matters, and it's a privilege to set up the conversation for Ilana and John. The Jews of Color Field Building Initiative is where we started. Uh, last year, we shrunk our name to the Jews of Color Initiative. And uh, we've been around for three years and our focus is on just three things in the community. We um, hold the nation's only philanthropic fund focused specifically on Jewish people of color. And we fund field building areas with the idea that if we at the initiative can help build the landscape, the infrastructure, if we can lay the pipes for leadership pathways, for engagement pathways for Jews of color in our community, um, then we can create all of the opportunities for people to come and engage. Uh, we focus on things like leadership development, research and knowledge making, policies, practices, and, best sta uh, and, and standards of practice. We also fund research for the national Jewish community, and we have the privilege of listening to all of you and hearing what you want to know, and then we go out and commission the research to bring you the answers. Uh, a year and a half ago, we brought you Counting Inconsistencies, which was a meta-analysis of Jews of color in the United States. We looked at federations. Um, we looked at your data around your community studies and helped make sense of how many Jews of color are there in the United States. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. And we also helped reveal and share with the community that uh, Jewish community federations and those who are doing demographic studies of Jews in the United States can ask better questions and can improve their research standards and techniques. And I would say our findings around how many Jews of color there are in the United States, that number is almost as important um, or in parallel, the findings about how to do better research is just as important, because if we can figure out how to do better research for Jews of color in the United States, we can actually figure out how to do better research for all Jews in the United States. And that would be the higher purpose of the work. And finally, we get to do educational opportunities like this with all of you. Um, let's talk about some numbers. The data tells us this. First of all, we operate using the number of 7 million Jews in the United States. We use that number. Some of you might be used to seeing the number of 5 million. We use number 7 million because it includes Jewish young people ages 0 to 18. Mark just shared that number from the Atlantic 57 study. And so we know um, that Jewish people zero, uh, ages 0 to 18 skew even more racially diverse than the rest of the cohorts in the, in the United States Jewish community. And so counting Jewish people zero to 18 is essential in understanding the patterns around Jews of color. Of the 7 million Jews in the United States at a minimum, about 1 million self-identify as people of color who are also Jewish. 
That means 12 to 15% of our national population are non-white Jewish people of color. In those numbers, we also know that something like 20% of the United States Jewish community, that's one in five Jewish families, self-identifies as multiracial. So not only does that mean that they have people of color in their homes, but when they're coming to our community, when they're part of our community engagement opportunities and activities, um, forgive me, the train that just went by, when our families are engaging in Jewish life, even if the white family member is in your community space, they're looking at your community through a lens of, um, is this multiracial? Is it safe for my community, for my family? Is it inclusive? Will my family thrive here? On the coast, in the West Coast in California, that number is one in four. So 25% of our families self-identify as multiracial. That means they see the world through multiracial lenses and they're thinking about things like racism as part of how they're experiencing the Jewish community. Um, we also know that undercounted, and we can use some more information, we have about 400 to 500,000 family members in the United States who self-identify as Sephardi and Mizrahi. Of that group, a subset self-identifies as people of color. And we also know that this theme of who is diverse in the US Jewish community, we know this theme of even race. Race is a social construct. Racism is very real. But this construction of race also means that we get to, in this conversation, think about even how did Jews become white, those who are white? How did our European family move from when my, my, my grandparents came to the United States from Poland and Romania? They were not classified as white. And so in this conversation around race and racism and Jewish people of color, we also get to raise up what it means for Jews who have self-identified white to wonder what does white mean in the United States? It's not that white is not real or doesn't come with real privileges, but for Jews who identify as white and European, we also know there's a conditionality around the privilege of whiteness and that conditionality becomes particularly tested in the context of white supremacy and white nationalism. I'm gonna keep going and I think there might be questions in there, but I'm gonna avoid them for now, forgive me. Um, when we think about at least one in seven Jews being people of color, I wanted you just to imagine like if you went to Dobbin this morning, when you opened your eyes after prayer, were there people of color around you? In every minion, there should be a person of color. When you think about your Jewish day school classroom, when you think any constellation of 10, 12, 14, there should be at least two, three people of color in those spaces. I also want to talk about this proportionality theme. And if you think about 12 to 15% of the US Jewish community being people of color, and every day, each next cohort of Jewish babies born in the United States is more racially cued than the day prior. So every day, our population gets bigger and bigger and bigger. In that context, when we're thinking about Jewish communal funding, when we run the numbers, and again, we don't have access to all the numbers out there, but when we've done an educated guess of running the numbers, something like less than 1% of Jewish communal funding goes to support Jewish people of color. And an example I would offer is, there was an unbelievable, robust, generous pot of funds created in the organized Jewish communal space in response to COVID-19 relief. And of those funds, something like 0.0049% went to Jews of color. What I wanna end the slide with is, from our work at the initiative, we have identified that there should be a hierarchy of funding also as in how we think about investing in Jewish people of color. We should think about kind of the highest order of funding is when we are thinking about funding Jews of color to support programs for Jews of color. And then if there were money left over, then we think about how can we support white led organizations in supporting Jews of color. But we want to invest in the leadership of Jews of color as much as we want to invest in Jews of color ourselves. Why does this matter? Well, first of all, we know from looking at our Zoom rooms, from looking at our boards, from looking at our Jewish communal organizations that in, in, in a large part, Jewish community leadership is almost exclusively white. That means we have obstacles to seeing and supporting the full Jewish community. We lack the capacity to, we simply lack the capacity. If we are decision makers in a room representing a diverse population, we lack the capacity to serve that population unless that population is part of the decision making. We also should have some sense of um, unsettlement, dis-ease, around a dynamic where white people are leading a diverse population. We want to make sure there's balance and there's equity and there's advocacy and there's centering of people. 
And we want to push back on any dynamic where we have one group of people and another group is marginalized, but that group of people is leading a marginalized group of people. The other point is we need to make sure that we, the leaders in this Zoom room right now, we are holding the responsibility of preparing for the current and the future. The population is diverse, full stop. The population is only getting more racially diverse, full stop. And so what does it mean that we have a paucity of role models? What does it mean that we have a paucity of intellectual infrastructure to respond to racial diversity? What does it mean that we have a paucity of infrastructure to respond to anti-racism as part of the fabric of how we want to live our Jewish values in the Jewish community? Um, equity and justice are obligations. And it is our responsibility as leaders to make sure not only are we holding sort of the, the, the charge of transforming our community, um, that we make sure that every time we are thinking about who's in this Jewish community, that we ensure our organization's capacity to count all Jews, to wonder who's missing from being counted, and to be very strategic about how we count. Recognizing that our view is limited, our perspective as individuals is part of our life experience, and that we have to bring rigor and discipline to the art of counting, of representing diverse voices, and making sure everybody's included. So what does it mean for each one of you to move closer towards anti-racism? And I'm gonna just go ahead and claim that term as part of this conversation. If you read uh, Professor Kennedy's book, or if you don't have the time for that, I wanna recommend, there's a beautiful podcast, uh, Brene Brown and Abraham Kendi in conversation about being anti-racist. Um, but between racist and anti-racist is not non-racist or neutral, or even well-meaning. It's just racist. And we have the opportunity as leaders, as funders, as people who influence the ecosystem to think about being anti-racist. And anti-racist is a verb, just like being Jewish from my perspective is a verb. And being anti-racist means not only do you have consciousness about race and racism, but each one of you in the face of racism, you take concrete action. You intervene, you interrupt. You are the only ones who in those moments can interrupt the physics of racism and the difference between being a bystander, the difference between being passive, and the difference between being racist and non-racist or anti-racist rather is taking concrete action. So I'm gonna leave you with four things and I'm gonna stop talking. First, what can you all do right now? You can reflect on the roots of wealth acquisition. I mean this in the most loving way. If you haven't read Decolonizing Wealth, I want to invite you to read the book and let's have a conversation about it. But if we don't get clear about the roots of the wealth that we steward, and if we haven't had consciousness about if that wealth came from extracting land or label from black and brown people, we cannot have a square, right, honest conversation about racism and race. We just can't. And it's not good or bad in terms of having the conversation. It's amazing to have it. Like, I don't want anybody to be um, skittish about having the conversation. I want you to be skittish about not having the conversation and the impact of not taking action and not reflecting on the, and on the roots of wealth acquisition. I want us each, each one of us in these three rooms that I, I have three screens, um, I want you to get clear on the value proposition um, about why you want to advocate for a multiracial, multi-ethnic, anti-racist community. For you, is it about the numbers? Is it about just population and just looking at sort of just the numbers and thinking to yourself, oh my goodness, if we don't do something now, we're gonna lose our opportunity to create a paradigm shift. Is it, a, do you have a halakhic mandate? Is it important to you from somewhere in text in Torah that this kind of equity is, is vital and essential to us as Jewish people? Um, is this about for you Jewish values, but really getting clear on not only your value proposition, but being confident about sharing your value proposition. I want you all to do that work with me. I want us to get honest about what's at stake. If we continue to be well-meaning and well-intentioned, but do nothing more. Is this enough? No. Um, as Mark shared with us by framing, this is just the beginning of the conversation. But if we stop here, what's at stake? And we should have that conversation with each other. And then I will end by saying, I wanna just push you and invite you and inspire you and motivate you to just move through this work with some rigor and some discipline and some vigor. Read everything, listen to everything, have every conversation you can about your intersection of philanthropy 
our multiracial Jewish community and how to do your work in ways that are anti-racist, multiracial, multi-ethnic, and about expanding our community, integrating our community, and making our Jewish community stronger. So with that, I'll stop talking. Thank you. Thank you, Ilana. And um, we look forward very much to learning with you, continuing to learn with you at other JFN sessions in the, in the coming years. Um, that this work does require a lot of time and, and greater knowledge, which I think we all aspire to. So let's move on to our next presenter, Ilana with an E, Rodan Schult. Hi, everyone. Um, so glad to be here today and share with you, really, our, our learnings were very early in this journey. Our foundation was started about two years ago. And I'll say Alana Kaufman has, has become a huge reason why I'm in this room today and why we're here. So i um, happy to share a bit more. When we started as a family, we were really clear on our goal. We wanted to build a thriving Jewish community for the next generation, thinking about my two young kids, their friends, um, and, and the rest of the community that's gonna follow. And we didn't really know what that meant, what the blind spots were in our community today, what the gaps were, what the obstacles were to being able to achieve that vision in 10, 15, 20 plus years. So we started with research like any good um, tech entrepreneur. And we worked very closely with Rossoff Consulting to look at all the available data in our community. We had a very robust community study from our federation from 2017. We also gathered some of our own data and relied on leaders like Alana Kaufman. And a couple themes came out, um, frankly, all of which were surprising because um, just by being participants in Jewish life our whole lives in the East Bay, they weren't obvious. Um, it really, we really needed to take kind of a strategic objective lens. And one of those areas for us is the enormous discrepancy, as you've heard, between who our Jewish community is in the East Bay and what organized Jewish life looks like. Who's showing up today? Who are the participants? Who are the staff? Who are the board members? We wanted to do something about that. And I'll just share one other stat, because I know you've heard a lot, but one that really struck us deeply, um, and that's from our community study. 83% of Jews of color feel welcome in our Jewish spaces, but 31% feel they belong. And to me, that's just an astounding gap of those who show up somewhere, um, show up to a synagogue or a JCC or you know whatever it may be, they feel greeted nicely, they feel welcome, but they leave saying, this isn't for me, I don't belong here. And when you think about our Jewish community, what we're all trying to do kind of reach the unaffiliated, that's my favorite um, saying that I hear from nearly every organization. And understanding these numbers really gives that context. The only way we're going to reach more people is by really focusing deeply on those who are not showing up today. And Jews of color is a really substantial portion of that group. And if I put it kind of in, on a personal twist, data aside, for me, it's thinking about my kids and the complex, beautiful community that we live in that is multiracial, that is multiethnic, um, that is multireligious. They're gonna make decisions as they come of age. And those might not be solely Jewish decisions. That's not the world that we live in. Um, but for me, Judaism and Jewish community is so important, it's so meaningful. And I wanna make sure that as they make whatever multiple, multitude of decisions they're gonna make, that the Jewish community is there for them, that it supports them and that it sees them. And so that, that really fuels our work. And I think this is a problem today. And when you think 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road, this is urgent and imperative and has to be dealt with. So I'll say that, that that was sort of the easy part, getting to all of that. Then it became, well, what do we do about it? And a year ago, there were even less options to take action. There's more now. And I'm, I feel inspired and hopeful that 
the field is continuing to grow and thrive and will only be more opportunities. So step one for us is learning and reflection. You heard this from Alana Kaufman. There are deep systemic structural reasons why Jews of color are not showing up, why they don't feel they belong. If we don't take the time to reflect and learn, we're gonna be dealing with symptoms. We're not gonna be dealing with the problem. We're not going to actually make change. So that is so critical. That is a lifelong journey. Um, that work never ends. None of this really does. Um, and I'll say that as I share some examples of our work, they've all been infused with some of the learnings that we've had. Beyond that, I think about our work in sort of four ways, um, a mix of short-term and long-term, and they're all very interconnected. One is how do we cultivate JOC leadership in our community? I don't believe we're going to make true change until we empower Jews of color to be making the decisions, to be designing the programs, to be doing the outreach. Um, two, how do we ready our Jewish organizations? We've talked about um, the fact that they're predominantly white and predominantly Ashkenazi. We need to do some work as Jewish institutions um, and Jewish organizations to make sure we're places where Jews of color can come in and thrive. That's the most important. Um, and while those two are kind of longer term, in the short term, what can we do to empower grassroots JOC community and learning experiences now? We don't wanna wait to make change, to have meaningful community. There's a lot that can be done today. And then finally, um, how do we support and strengthen the ecosystem supporting Jews of color? How do we ensure that the organizations that are leading the space are strong? How do we build broad funding support? How do we make sure that this is all becomes part of an engine of Jewish community? So finally, I'll just share a couple examples. There's a lot I would love to share, but I know for sake of time, I'll pick two. Um, one is a great partnership that we've undertaken with Ben the Ark to do what's called Project Shabash. And it's a leadership pipeline for Jews of color in the East Bay. And I'll say the more that I've learned and reflected, the more I've really realized how genius the construction of this pilot is, because it really checks a couple different boxes. One, it identifies a group of potential JOC leaders in our community, and it takes time to build community among them, build confidence, build learning, and kind of ready them to take on leadership roles within our Jewish community, both as lay leaders and as staff. It also looks at our local Jewish organizations and helps them with the readiness work to be welcoming places where these leaders can thrive. And then it matches them together um, in a sort of fellowship model. So really excited about that and what we're gonna learn that's just off the ground with two fabulous Jews of color women running those progr that program. And then the second area on this, um, empowering grassroots JOC community angle, we wanted to, again, get the ball rolling now, empower more experiences for JOCs. What we quickly realized is that as a white-led Ashkenazi foundation, we're not in a position to be making decisions on what, what are great ideas in this space, what's gonna work, what's gonna move the needle. So what we've ended up doing here is a great partnership with Alana Kaufman and the Josie Initiative. And it's, it's an initiative around empowering and engaging Jews of color. And Alana and her fabulous team have written the RFP, have marketed it, have put it out to the community, and will be evaluating ideas and making full funding decisions. So that was a really important evolution for us to realize where we have experience and can make funding decisions and where, where we don't, frankly, and where we want to invest in great JOC leaders who can do that work on our behalf um, and move the needle there. So I'll just close with saying that this has been really one of the most rewarding areas of my work for me in the past year to, as Andre said earlier, see a problem or an opportunity that you can't unsee um, and really continuously work hard to make change. I see this as lifelong work. It's very reflective. Um, it's very deep and um, very happy to be in this journey with all of you and excited about what we can achieve together. 
Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to a real friend and colleague who has led so much of this work um, in our community, both nationally and also locally, um, and is a huge source of inspiration for us. And that's John Marker. That is far too kind. Uh, good morning, everyone. It is an incredible pleasure. Thank you for the invitation to be here alongside Alana and Alana and share some of the conversations we've been having amongst ourselves more openly. Before I get going, I just want to acknowledge that um, you know, in spite of the hopefulness of the title of this seminar, there are still many of us facing smoke and fires in this moment. And my heart, our hearts go out to everyone as we continue to stand in our tradition and, and pray for rain in this time of year. Um, so with that, my goal in the next six minutes is to share how the Jim Joseph Foundation has looked back to our founding documents and our core mission to define our commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion within and across the Jewish community. And to those that don't know, the Jim Joseph Foundation is based in San Francisco. We are a national funder. And when we released the Jim Joseph Foundation updated strategic roadmap in the second half of 2019, our mission was and remains to foster compelling, effective Jewish learning experiences for Jews. And we were clear that in a world that is constantly shifting and changing, there remains a strong and persistent human desire for connection, meaning, and purpose, and that Judaism has continually evolved over thousands of years to meet that need. In the same document, we also call out a focus on elevating diverse voices and perspectives, and we hold a belief that Jewish learning experiences and the Jewish community will be richer when our leaders, our educators, and our participants better reflect the full of today's Jewish population. Now, sharing this lens was not to open ourselves up as the experts or the authority, but to position ourselves as learners side by side with our grantee partners, because they're the ones who are doing this work every day. And what they shared back with us is that a focus on DEI is not only the right thing to do, at the end of the day, we can't achieve the core of our mission without a focus on DEI, because we would be excluding a growing number of voices, as Alana showed us through demographics, and we'd be becoming irrelevant to a larger and larger number of folks who might look like me, but see the intersectionality that exists in their world. And we want Judaism to be relevant to both of these groups. So for us, this isn't about building a checklist and signing off. And it's also not about standing up a new vertical of the Jim Joseph Foundation that is explicitly devoted to DEI as a standalone investment strategy, but rather we know that we can't invest in educators and leaders. We can't invest in powerful Jewish learning experiences or research and development without using DEI as a lens. And it just goes straight back to what Alana Kaufman shared that there is no neutral in this work. Everything is a decision point. So at the Jim Joseph Foundation, we believe that there is a dynamism to our Jewish memory, our history, our traditions, and that that has the risk and has often been erased and eroded. And we have deprived ourselves of the richness when we defer to one monolithic narrative, which often looks like a patriarchal, Ashkenormative, white, cisgendered, heteronormative, able-bodied expression of what Judaism could be. Through this narrative, the Jewish story becomes less resilient. It offers less opportunity for connection, meaning, and purpose, both for those who identify as Jews of color or non-binary folk or female or queer or differently abled, but it also reduces it for those of us who might be white or heteronormative or any of the other markers. 
So with this information, we built a mentality that we're working on making a series of formative investments. This is still the early stage. We aren't saying that organizations need to be perfect or that there's one right way to do DEI, that everyone is here to contribute to the conversation and the learning journey that we are collectively on as folks elevate new ways of finding connection, meaning, and purpose. And as we all expand the aperture of what we know of as Jewish wisdom and learning. And we recognize that some of these ideas and the development of organizations are not on the same scale with other grantee partners of the Jim Foundation, but that's in part due to the decades in which our communal world has underinvested in these initiatives. And we know that the projects we invest in today are going to lead to the shifting of these larger institutions that we invest in, many of which are household names. And we also know that this is going to lead to incredible new projects led by Jews of color, like the Jews of Color Initiative and the work that Alana Kaufman is spearheading, but also other initiatives like Amud, the Jews of Color Torah Academy and others. So admittedly, this isn't something that we all just know how to do instinctively. This takes work and it takes discomfort. And we find that that's essential because the discomfort from a place of privilege as a funder shows that we're on our learning edge. And I'm so grateful that at this point, there is a group of 40 national and local funders that Ilana Rodin had alluded to that we have the privilege of joining in regular calls on this topic. And please feel free to reach out, chat me, send me an email if you wanna be involved and learn more about joining that space. For us at the Jim Joseph Foundation, this work is about realizing that using a DEI lens when we think about the Jewish stories and wisdom that we choose to tell and remember and learn from represents an opportunity for more connection, meaning, and purpose for all of us. And we are so grateful to be on this journey with each and every one of you. And with that, I think I'm passing it back to Mark to take us to the next part of this session. Thank you. John, and thank you to the Jim Joseph Foundation and you personally for your leadership in this important work. And I'm gonna pass it back to Ilana Kaufman to set us up with a couple of questions that we can answer together or privately. So there are a couple of questions that came in in the chat around um, racial identity about Jews of color. And so I'm gonna try to respond to those and I'd also welcome a couple of more questions that might be interesting for the whole group. Um, and then what I want to do is I'm actually going to leave you with some questions to think about um, and port with you so that we don't have to rush through our opportunity for reflection. Um, I think that both the intersection of ambition to smush this all into 45 minutes and just like just the vast amounts of not only content, but just your own interest in dialoguing and having conversation invites us to recognize there's a lot to talk about, not to try to do it all in this moment. There were a number of questions about racial identity of Jews of color. And so what I wanna offer you is a conceptual framework to inform your thinking. And then I want you to use that to think about your own work out there and how you're thinking about these ideas. The Jews of Color Initiative was founded to respond to racism in the United States. And so we think about Jews of color for the purpose of our work within a very tight United States framework and construct. The United States was established on racism and white supremacy. That's not an arguable fact and it subjugated black and brown people over an arc of time and created racial categories in response to those who were not white. However, the organizing, uh, however, the United States conceived of and thought about white at any given time over the arc of US history. And so first of all, just when you think about Jews of color, people of color, that concept is in response to whiteness. And that concept of us being people of color or Jews of color means that there's a normative, which is that standard of white. Um, for the purpose of the work, we would offer that Jews of color in the United States, and again, this is not a definition, it's a conceptual framework to inform how we think and how we do and how we act. Um, but we recognize that black and brown people in this country, black and African-American, um, Asian and Asian-American, uh, Native American and indigenous and first nation, multiracial um, and Latino people, 
collectively identify and share the experience of being people of color in this country. Some of you asked about the Latinx community. Some of you asked about Asians. And what I would say is this, um, first of all, you know, people should self-identify racially however is meaningful to them. Um, I had a meeting yesterday with a Latinx Jewish scholar to talk with me particularly about Latino Jewish identity. And what I would say is um, the data tells us that for younger generations in the United States, they squarely identify as Latino and as people of color based on a US experience of racism. For people who immigrate to the United States from countries that are identified as Latino, what I would say is and what I learned is if that country has a history of being colonized, then those people very much identify as people of color in the United States because they share a history of being colonized with those of us who have been born and raised in the United States. If, if Latinx folks come from countries where they carry their European experience with them and that European experience has been sort of protected in some ways, they may not identify as people of color in the United States the same way others have. I'm not an expert on this, but I wanna offer you a little texture and a little, a little frame and a little lens. And also of course, multiracial people in the United States. What we know is in California, half of the state is already people of color. What we know is by 2042, the United States will become a majority people of color. And so what we need to do is develop not only our capacity to understand what it means to be multiracial, but to appreciate that racial identity is also fluid and it's conditional. And I will end by saying, so what I mean by that is as a light-skinned Black person, I can walk into a space and I get privileges because I'm light-skinned. And so also when you're thinking about Jews of color and racial identity, think about the conditionality of it and sort of the, um, the uh, fluidity of it in that context. All right. Um, there's a great question that came in around how do we balance tokenism? as we think about moving forward. And so let me offer like a little tool. If you are identifying somebody to join your board or your leadership team or your think tank or your advisory board, and then I'm gonna, uh, we'll do maybe one more question and hand it over to Amy. If you are identifying somebody, um, not because they're amazing at budgeting or not because they're amazing at strategic planning, right? Or not because they're amazing at the core competencies and requirements of the work that needs to be done wherever you're inviting them to. And you're inviting them because they're lovely, they're kind, you like their vibe, and they happen to be a Jewish person of color, you are tokenizing them. If you are not connecting with somebody because they are excellent and amazing and badass at the core competencies of the work, and you want them simply because they represent an aesthetic, a view, a perspective, um, based on their phenotype and how they racially present, then you are tokenizing them. The other tool I would offer is when you're bringing diverse people into your community, when you bring one, that person has to be a bridge. The burden on them is pretty great because they have to not only be able to do the work and be excellent, but they have to be able to put up with the dynamics of racism and be um, cordial and extremely collegial so that they don't ruffle feathers. When you have two, they work as a team. They don't want to disrupt anything very much. You get some shared perspective. But when you bring on three, this group has an opportunity to be diverse among themselves. They have an opportunity to share their own perspectives or to do shared perspectives. And so I also want you to sort of think about tokenism, not only in terms of bringing one person, but how many you're bringing to actually shift the dynamics and the culture of what you're doing in your organization. Um, let me do one more question and I'm going to hand it over to Amy. Um, let's talk a little bit about supporting and building our pipeline of JOC evaluators and researchers for our field. Um, oh, I love talking about research and data. Let me keep it brief. Um, there is a paucity of organized uh, networks of JOC researchers, PhDs, evaluators to work in our space. I will be very honest with you and say we had the privilege of having our first organizational evaluation this year and we had to push pretty hard to not only ensure that our research team was racially diverse but they actually had skills and tools as informed by diversity, inclusion, equity, and justice. That they had cultural competency training. And so in general what I want to say to you is before we even think about research and evaluators make sure all the professionals are trained have DEI training, have cultural competency training. It's essential. Um, and then I want you to know, we have helped network and find 
a whole cadre of PhD JOCs out there who are part of our own research work and do on our own research studies. And so if you build it, they might come. If you have an opportunity, put it out there and you might find exactly who you might find. If you go to our newsletter, let me end by saying there was a profile on one of our, our, our quantitative um, analysts is named Gage and they were profiled in our newsletter this week or in the last newsletter. Um, Gage talks about how they waited for an opportunity to actually get to do social science research in the JOC community. And so we have to create the opportunities and when we do, we might find that our people are waiting for us and then we only make our community stronger. With that, please let me turn it over to my colleague and friend, Amy Rubino. Thank you. I'm Amy Rubino. I'm the executive director of the John Pritzker Family Fund. I'd like to thank all the presenters on behalf of the planning committee, Mark Reisbaum, Ilana Kaufman, Alana Schulp, and John Marker. If you haven't already, please choose a topic for our next breakout session and indicate your preference in the chat box. We will have presentations on JCCs, Jewish camps, and arts and culture. We're grateful that this topic has generated so much interest. Please know that this is just the beginning of a larger conversation that we will continue with future programming. And in the evaluation that will follow our convening today, please indicate your interest if you'd like to know about future DEI programming. Um, Alana Schultz, uh, Mark Reisbaum, and John Marker are available for one-on-one -on -one conversations with any funders wanting to learn more about how to make an impact in this space. Please refer to the conference directory that you received or reach out to Deborah or Tsivia for contact information.